so I could testify tonight? Hmm, got an idea for next Sunday. So tonight I want to put the second installment of uh, Uprooting Rejection, Part 2. And uh, so I encourage you to open your heart because this really does delve into some very sensitive issues that um, perhaps will really help you tonight, and I trust it will, or you've already um, come to realize these things because our God is a healer. Can you say amen? He heals the wounded spirits. He heals broken hearts. He heals broken lives, relationships. And tonight, we're going to look at uprooting rejection or finding it and uprooting it. And so um, we're going to hand out just a few scriptures. Uh, there's not a lot we're going to read today, but there are a few I need help with. So I need you to help me here. Psalms 27, verse 10. Somebody would get that for us. That's our, uh, our starting scripture. Uh, Ash, you would get that. And he needs someone to get... Um, As I said, there's not a lot. So John 8, 44, uh, Hector in the back there. Um, let's go to 1 John 4, 18. 1 John 4, 18. Um, Diana, you would get that. Luke chapter 15, 29 and 30. 29 and 30. Okay, Eduardo's going to get that. And then we got someone to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2, 8. Okay, so you get that for us. Okay, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? Okay, Psalms 27, verse 10. Uh, read it for us, please. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. One more time. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Amen. So we're looking at the principle of rejection in people's lives. And so <clears throat> let me talk for a minute here. First of all, we're dealing with disapproval uh, that we're feeling or of the lack of being valued. So rejection is the root of so many unhealthy and destructive emotions, bad reactions that people have, unhealthy mindsets, and uh, people making wrong choices, constantly making wrong choices or haphazardly. And so we're going to look at the roots of rejection in order to bring freedom. Because we're not just doing this to make people, uh, you know, dig back into their memory banks or feel bad or just leave dejected. But so God can bring freedom. And so we believe in supernatural deliverance. We believe in the power of truth. And uh, in this, we will find freedom to uproot rejection. So the most common place rejection occurs is in the home. It's in the home, rejection. How do you say rejection in Spanish? Rejection? Rechazar? Okay, is that true? Okay. Just want to make sure we're on the same page here. And so rejection in the home or the lack thereof. And so people that have not much of what they could call a home. And God can heal us here even today. So God has designed family to be the foundation of human relationships and to help form our personality. Family and home is meant to be a place of acceptance. Children can run and cling to their parents uh, you know, because this is where they are accepted. We're supposed to get acceptance here first. If some little kids are here and they get hurt, you know, and uh, if they're not mine, they typically don't run to me first because they're not sure how I'm going to react. They run to mom or dad and because uh, they know they're going to find acceptance. In a perfect world, this is what families should be, both father and mother. That's man and woman in case you're taking notes, and that they would want the child even if it wasn't planned. They would raise the children. They would be involved. They would offer provision. They would get instruction, and, uh, uh, and they would give correction when necessary. They would love the children <clears throat> with words, with affection. They would accept the child 
because love is not based on performance. It's not based on them doing everything right. So when this is present in a healthy family relationship, this provides powerful things inside of a person. So identity. It provides us identity, who you are. I think everyone at some point has asked themselves, who am I? And so this offers them confidence, understanding your worth, understanding your value as you have experienced uh, uh, this upbringing, that you understand that you matter and you have value, how you see yourself. So reference points, what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to be. I was shocked when I read about uh, Jane Fonda, and I mentioned it this morning, how her father told her, look, it's all about how you look. It's all, you know, say here's a woman for years is a lack of confidence and probably, you know, doing everything she can to be, you know, perfect in every way and never probably never quite measuring up. And so um, reference points to what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to be. And so a good home also provides boundaries. How much is too far? What is it? Uh, what is unacceptable? And so I in my past, I did. I. Um, uh, a lot of uh, drugs and whatnot, but there was there were certain things that would scare me, and and so I saw people cross all kinds of lines that I looked at and says, yeah, I'm I'm never going to stick a needle in my arm. I'm not going to do these things. Um, I'm not saying I was better, but I'm just saying there were boundaries that were there, and I could tell that it was because of the life that I had growing up. But this is not what happens in many people's lives. Many people don't have this good, solid, healthy home life and so the home can be a place of the first rejections that they experience in fact the greatest rejections in all of life there's a book by John Bevere uh, called the bait of Satan very powerful book and uh, I I was reminded about it because um, an inmate that I was doing chaplain work uh, had the book and I said wow that that is a very good book and he said my gosh is dealing with people being trapped with bitterness and anger, but it also deals with rejection. Psalms 27.10 in the New Living Translation, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. So that is a promise that we have. The Bible tells stories of family rejection because it's common through all generations. So let's look at some of the many ways rejection comes into the home. Birth, uh, the birth not being wanted, for example. The child being born, uh, it's an unwanted pregnancy. Whether it's due to age, maybe they're too young or maybe they're too old. Maybe it's a result of an affair. Maybe there's incest involved. Maybe there's rape uh, as the cause of this. Maybe there's finances that are just uh, not there. Difficulties in life. Uh, They want to give the child up for adoption. Uh, Of course, abort it. Uh, and this is actually felt in the womb. I didn't give out Jeremiah 1.5. I apologize. Can somebody grab that real quick? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, Liz would go there for us. So th- there are experiences. You know, we've all uh, dealt with children. You say, oh, they recognize my voice, right? How many have ever seen that? You know, you're talking to the child still in the belly, right? And they recognize you and they realize you can't sing. They know that from the get-go. <laughs> but Jeremiah 1.5, read that for us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So God only, not only designed us in the womb, fearfully and wonderfully made, but he planned our lives in the womb. He knew who, what we were going to be before we were born. He knew if we were going to uh, work on a computer or swing a hammer. He knew these things. Disappointment, uh, other uh, uh, possibilities, uh, causes of rejection. Disappointment over a child's sex. I wanted a boy. I hate men. And, and, you know, these things uh, actually happen. Uh, the disappointment. 
And uh, I, I don't know why people get so amped up about that, but it does happen. Inherited rejection. Parents themselves that have a root of rejection pass it on spiritually and literally to their children. So one of the things I would suggest is that you have mercy on your parents because they probably didn't know anything and they didn't know any better when they were doing the things that they were doing. Uh, children suffer abandonment. Parents that will leave their children. They won't raise them after pregnancy. And so they run away for various reasons. Uh, they're stressed out. They, it was just an affair and there was nothing, uh, anything beyond that. Uh, and th there could just be, they're selfish. Maybe they're afraid and all of these concerns are there. Uh, divorce. Divorce can, can, can issue a rejection inside of a child's life. I can't take it, so I'm going to leave. You know, I was uh, concerning rap music and uh, lots of rap songs about dad and mom that chose drugs over me. There's actually a song called Drugs Over Me by a guy named Handsome. And uh, my drug-addicted father would say he's going to pick me up and spend time with me, but he didn't. And so he loved drugs more than me. And uh, children have experienced this, where they're given a backseat to things that really mean nothing. Addictions, alcohol, drugs, pornography. These things go to work not only upon the person that's involved, but upon the, ch the children. Uh, a failure to love, a failure to meet needs. And so these things will cause instability. You can send your children messages that, uh, uh, you know, um, they have no value in various ways. Uh, I can't remember the, the, the people involved, but there was a writer. One day he, um, uh, something went wrong with his job and he uh, wound up going fishing with his son. And he really didn't want to, but he went fishing with his son. And uh, later on, his son had mentioned somehow, hey, he goes, that was one of the best days of my life. And the father in his journal said, another day wasted. I went fishing with my son. So things like that begin to work inside of a young person's life. There's abuse. There's physical violence. There's verbal abuse. There's sexual abuse. And so these attack your worth. And so how many have heard the phrase before that hurt people hurt people? And this is true. I've... Over the years, I've been saved for 37 years and, uh, you know, um, through ministry and just being a witness, even, you know, just you on your job. You know, I used to witness the construction workers all the time. And, uh, and uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to come to you and they've got some huge rejection issues or things that they're dealing with. And it boggles the mind of what sometimes people put their kids through. And so these attack our worth. They give a false or twisted message of your worth. There can be harsh words. What good are you? You're stupid. You're worthless. I hate you. I never wanted you. I wish you were never born. These are harsh things, but we know that these things happen. Just today I saw someone had the little boy outside with someone else while they were in the house smoking marijuana. So abuse can be deliberate. These harsh words can uh, overflow and uh, cause issues. Uh, parents that withhold love, parents that do not physically demonstrate love for their children, give them affection. You know, when it comes to children, how many here know how to spell love? How do you spell it? T-I-M-E. They're not giving time to their children. You know, as a grandparent, I realize now that giving your children time is a bit of a sacrifice. <laughs> you know, and I, hey, I'm not, whatever people wind up doing, but I'm, I'm glad that I had our children relatively young when I could still play football. 
Because, <laughs> you know, you're, you're pushing 60, and they want to go out and play tackle football. It's like... But to spend time in ability to express love. No words of love, no value, no acceptance. There's coldness, there's inattention. And so the parent is just there. He's just there. As I do chaplain work, I, I, it it's, it's never surprises me how these individuals have had no father in their life. Or if he was in their life, he wasn't involved. And so there's no interaction. I'm sure my father and mother loved me. They just never said it or never showed it in any way. Um, in the home, they can be demanding and hard to please. Our missionaries over in Taiwan tell us all the time that the, um, the children in that culture, they go to school. I think they start school around between 6 and 7 until 7 at night. I'm talking 5-year-olds, 6-year-olds. They're in school all day. And uh, there are reasons for that. But these kids really are pressed to perform. Talk to someone who's uh, ministered in Taiwan. And I'm sure that China is probably similar. Where there's a, a, a performance-based situation. I will love you. I will accept you if you do right. If you win. If you succeed. <clears throat> Big problem is we don't always win, do we? We don't always succeed. We don't always do right. You know, some children can never do enough to please their parents. And so one young man came in second place in a steak track meet. And his dad says, how does it feel to be the first loser? There's favoritism that's at work when a parent blatantly prefers one sibling over another, and so why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? Jacob and Esau, there was chaos because each parent had a favorite. Sibling rivalry, competition, and some, some parents encourage this, that they need to compete. It will help you get ahead in life. I remember the Klitschko brothers, they're the heavyweight boxers in Ukraine. They both were boxers, and the mom says, promise me this, you never fight each other. <laughs> so all these kinds of things can produce rejection or a sense of feeling rejection. Rejection can be defined as a profound sense of being unwanted. The word rejection means to be cast aside, to be thrown away, as having no value. Rejection gives us the message, we have no value. We don't fit. We don't measure up. Something is wrong with me. So there's lots of things that can plant seeds of rejection. And I would say that many of us here have experienced rejection on one level or another in the home because parents, parents are imperfect. And so this isn't, a time for us to uh, look at our parents in every little thing that they've done wrong. Obviously, we can't give people a pass, but we're, we're laying this out because if there's a root of rejection inside of us, that we, let, we, we root it out. And so many parents really have no idea what they're doing. So let's consider tonight uh, the lies of rejection. The greatest danger rejection of rejection is that rejection tells us lies that we believe and that we embrace. The devil's greatest strategy is to give us, get us to believe lies. Eve's life was changed because she believed lies. Who has John 8? Did I give that out? John 8, verse 44. Yes. It says... You are, the fa you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks is a lie. He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Another translation says when he speaks, 
He speaks, when he lies, he speaks his native language. And so the devil wants to get you and I to believe things that are not true about us first and foremost. So what are some things or what are some lies that, of, uh, that rejection gets us to believe? And I'm, I'm asking you for some responses. What are the lies that rejection gets us to believe? Have any thoughts on that? comments and we've mentioned a lot of them already when you're say in the home you're repeated by a parent that you're stupid and it may be like jokingly or intentional unintentional upon repeating it over and over and over again you start to believe that you are stupid mm. So that's, that's one. That's huge. That's huge. Anything else? Um, you start to think that you're like the cause of a lot of these problems or these issues, like for divorce or you know things that are happening. You you start to believe that because you feel rejected, maybe that you caused this or you're kind of the problem, but you're not. Yeah, that's common in divorce from, from discussions I've had. That your parent left, and it's your fault. Yes. Mm. And you embrace it. Yeah. Anyone else? If you were a better child, you know, they wouldn't have done that. Or she wouldn't have done that or he wouldn't have done that. So people live with an overall feeling of guilt. I don't deserve anything good. I deserve bad things. Your worth is based on performance. I only deserve love if I perform well. God forbid that uh, somebody would critique your cooking. Now, I get it. I get it. There's wisdom here. <laughs> you got to be. But you don't deserve anything or not used to anything. And so your worth, again, is based on performance. If I do right. So you need to be perfect. Only if I am perfect, people will uh, then not reject me again. So everyone in life, you get this idea that everyone in life is going to reject you like your parents have rejected you. And it becomes, as Hector says, part of your identity. So the primary result of rejection that we have to be concerned about is the inability to receive or communicate love. So you are able to receive love and you are able to communicate love. Human relationships can become very mechanical. Some struggle with communication. And they'll struggle with telling people they love how they feel about them. It's hard to be open, hard to be transparent. And so they might reject you if they knew what you're really thinking. So we can struggle with affection, receiving it, don't touch me. And it's a very interesting dynamic that um, rejection in life can affect our relationship with God. And this really is a huge, huge issue. <clears throat> One author said that we transfer our feelings toward our parents onto God. And guess what? Your parents are not God. But having issues in that arena can cause problems on you having interaction with God himself. Amen. I think about it. If, 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 if it can be hard to have affection toward your heavenly father if you've had a bad relationship with your earthly father. 
When people talk about our Heavenly Father, it's, 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 it's hard to compute that. And some, some people will really struggle with that. A question. What is the opposite of love? Hate. It's fear. It's not hate. The opposite of love is fear. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is, not, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Okay. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. That is so powerful. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. People can be saved, yet they live in fear in their relationship with God. I'm afraid God can't be trusted. He will let me down. He will let me down. My parents have let me down. This person has let me down. My spouse has let me down. My siblings have let me down. And, it, and it's difficult. You know, I, one of the things I've learned, in, and not just because I came to California, but um, how many families are in disarray and how, how easily that, could, that can begin to happen. And then there's all kinds of issues that are at work. And really, there's fear. Rejection can translate into a problem the Bible calls, calls the fear of man. When people come off as a tough guy or tough girl or a bully, it can be rooted in rejection. I want you to think about this. Years ago, I was dealing with a guy, and he was a tough guy. And as I would pray about it, I realized that he was acting out of the fear of man and discovered that he suffered um, rejection from a MIA alcoholic father. A father that wanted nothing to do with him in his life. So this guy would turn around and he would be hard on lots of other people. So it can be that the tough guy and the bully really is dealing with rejection issues. So we have to be, learn to be um, honest with ourselves. We have to learn to be honest with God because he's the one that can heal us. You know, if, you and I have to come before God and simply be open and transparent. You may feel like you don't measure up in God's eyes, or he may give up on you once he sees what you're really like. You know, God knows what we're really like. He knows us, really. And truthfully, none of us measure up. That is why Jesus went to the cross in our place. You and I don't have to perform in order to deserve or earn God's love. So the rejection no longer has to define you. I gave out Luke 15, 29 and 30. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandments, your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat uh, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, he killed the, the fatted cow for him. <coughs> okay, so this is the prodigal son in Luke 15. So the prodigal son's story usually centers on the prodigal son. But this is after the prodigal came back, came to his senses, came back to his father. Father, forgive me. You know, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. 
Cain completely repented. And a father like most fathers that really have invested in their son, he's overjoyed. He's rejoicing. He's, he's just stirred and excited. But the older brother says, look, I've been slaving for you and never disobey your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who have squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Whoa. This, this older brother's got some things that are stirring inside of him, doesn't he? And so uh, we, we oftentimes, this is at the end of the parable. By then you're already tired. You're not paying attention. <laughs> but here we have. The older brother was living with a twisted mindset about his performance, and he didn't understand grace. He didn't understand grace for his brother, and he didn't understand grace in his relationship with his father. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing right. There's nothing wrong with following orders. That doesn't mean we go out and we're just rebels and we do nothing right. <laughs> But in the kingdom of God, we are accepted because of God's grace. So that's the glorious thing about salvation. I, um, you know, I uh, deal uh, on occasion with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, out here. But little do you know that they're in where I do chaplain work, too. And the thing that troubles me about them is it is a works based religion. That's the problem. It's not because we just like arguing about. No, no, no. It's a works-based religion. We sang a song tonight about Jesus being the center. He is the center. He's the Alpha and the Omega. When we go to heaven, he is on the throne, my friend. But they, they basically have Jesus. Oh, he's a good example. But he's not the center of things. And so then, then what does it become? Well, it becomes your, your, your actions, your relationship with, uh, with God through your performance. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is a gift of God. Of God. It is a gift of God. You know, maybe you are not used to getting gifts. Somebody told me they're not used to, you know, people making any to do about their birthday. And there's no, there's no, there's nothing being used to somebody just, hey, I'm blessing. I'm here to bless you. But that's what salvation is. And so with uprooting rejection, we have to get to the root. We have to find we have to get to the root of things and simply allow God to do the work. You know, when a surgeon goes to work, uh, for those of you here, you've had surgeries over the years. You got someone who's going to put you under and they're going to break out a knife and they're going to be cutting and they're going to be removing and they're going to be, you know, draining and they're going to be sewing. They're going to go to work, but they've got to get down to where the issue is. And so the same is true for you and I to get to the place where, hey, where, where why am I like this? What is going on? What's happening? Why am I mad at everybody? You know, that, that shouldn't be. I understand we live in a, a world that has rejected God, but that doesn't mean you and I can't have compassion upon people. Of course, our brothers and sisters, but even in our world. So when God is speaking to us, amen, I encourage you to open your heart. Say, Lord, I'm here. You want to do surgery on me? I'm here, man. Just like with, uh, with the doctors, as, as time goes on, I get more and more picky about who my doctor is. <laughs> If he's going to do something, he's okay. How you doing today? <laughs> How have you been? What's going on in your life? Why are your hands shaking? <laughs> I don't want. But see, you can trust God. Because he is the master surgeon. He's the great physician. And he's here to help us 
and heal us. Let God help you and understand that you are accepted in the family of God. Maybe you had issues before, here, there, and so the issue is today. Allow God to do something today. Not because of your perfect life, but because of God's ability and God's grace. Amen. Let's bow our heads this evening.